that God was working in my heart. Faith is as small as a mustard seed. You know, different little passages, and then they take it away from you because they didn't want you to really read too much. So we have the, the testimony of the apostles. We have Paul in the epistles. We have the writer of Hebrews. God at various times in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. Has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the worlds. Jesus. He's also holding things together by his powerful world. Word. Yeah, I don't know if you know science at all, but there's some, it's called the second law of thermodynamics. All order becomes disorder. You get up in the morning, you comb your hair, by the end of the day, it's a mess. <laughs> so, that's disorder. You need a law for that? Everything, everything degenerates. Our bodies, look at us. We're, we're aging, we're old. Our cars, rock salt, rust. Ah, I need a new car. Every all order becomes disorder. But you know what? It's not happening in the universe. It's not happening. It's all held together by his powerful word. You know, it's not spinning and spiraling all out of control. Even if you read NASA and all their, you know, doomsday things that occasionally they come up with to get more funding. But for the most part, God is holding the world together. For every house is built by someone, but who, he who built all things is God. We have Peter in his epistle. He said, For, for this they were will, willfully ignorant, that the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Now people are willingly ignorant. They willingly will not listen to people talk about creation. If you see some debates, people talking in the media, they shut them right up. They shout all over them. They don't want to hear it. It's a different way, a different perspective of looking at things. You know, I, I gave it a good example. My son, you know, he's, he uh, went to public school. And he had a teacher, and the teacher was teaching uh, about fossils, about historical evidence of God. And I had gone over Bible study with my son on creationism, you know, a couple years before. And a lot of it was based on The Long War Against God by Henry Morris. Excellent book if you ever, you know, want to read it. I have a copy. And the teacher said, he was going through examining the fossil record, and he said, this fossil is millions and millions of years old. This fossil in this layer is, is this old. This fossil is this old. And my son, my son raised his hand and he said, the teacher said, yes. He says, how do you know that it's that old? And the teacher said, by what layer the fossil was found in? And my son said, oh. Didn't talk. Then my son kind of thought the teacher talked a little more. Raised his hand again. He says, how do you know how old the fossil is? And the teacher said, by what layer the fossil is in. So here it is. It's circular thinking. Or, you know, the, the fossil, you tell the age of the fossil by the layer it's in, and you tell the layer how old the layer is by what fossil is found in it. it, it my son said, that's circular thinking. It doesn't make sense. So you have to be thoughtful and think about what you're being told in the world. Yes, that's right. You know, the TV, everything you put on, it's, it's just bombarding you, the Christian even. So what's the message for you to shut up? You're ignorant, you don't know better. Mm -hmm. Educate yourself in apologetics. Look at these things. Yes. That's right. you know. in Revelations 10, 5 and 6, the angel who I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, and there should be no delay no longer. Then we have the testimony of heaven about the creation, Revelations 11. You, o, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Then Revelations, I forgot, I didn't write down the chapter here, let's see, 14.7 says, Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of judgment has come, and worship Him who has made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. So the conclusion is to this part of the sermon is that 
The biblical answer to the question of origins is clear. Matter is not eternal, but was created by a supreme being. If you talk to someone who doesn't believe in creation, you can trace all the way back to dirt. That's why you see bumper stickers that say, dirt worshiping pagan on the back of them. Because basically, in the beginning was God, or in the beginning was dirt. I believe it was God. Something had to make that matter. Matter is neither created or destroyed, as Carl and I were talking about on break. So, created, it was created by the God of Israel, together with the Son and Spirit, Genesis 1, Colossians 1, 16. Those who believe in creation by a supreme gene, being join those who had a great impact on the history of mankind. Moses, David, Solomon, Jesus, Paul. They have a solid foundation on which to build their lives and to direct their actions. Makes you accountable. Creation, every day when you go out there and you look at it, it makes you accountable. You know that there is a God. People don't want to believe that. Of course, some are not willing to accept the biblical answer. Some are not wanting to, unwilling to face the consequences. That's why they're willfully ignorant. They don't want to know. Some are not, are not aware of the evidence that will support creation. That's the message. We have to make them aware. Now we shall consider another one of those evidences. And what I'm going to talk about is the philosophical, philosophical case for creation. When I spoke to the uh, case of, cre of creation, I kind of raised some basic questions. Where did life come from? How did it begin? Is matter eternal? The life evolving through pure natural processes? I mean, there is something that's called macro evolution. Animals adapt, but they don't change into different life forms. You've got a Chihuahua and a Great Dane. Are they, are they dogs? Yeah, they're both dogs. You've got birds. You know, just because they have different beaks, that doesn't mean they adapt it. They transfer it into another species. They didn't jump over it to be something else. The media will tell you that. The scientists will tell you that. But as we kind of explore and we go through this, we see more and more scientists are starting to believe in the doctrine of creation. Every design has a creator. There's a mastermind behind everything. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. When we review this, the biblical case for creation, which states that matter is not eternal, is created by a spiritual being, and in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created it. He made it out of nothing. Many, of course, are not content with the simple accepting the biblical claim, wanting more reasons to believe in God and creation. That's eh, not enough. That's eh, not enough. You could show them to your blue in the face. Right. Mockers and scorners will not inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. So we have the philosophical case which presents several reasons to believe in God and creation as the explanation of the origin of life. I'm just going to go through review five. Number one, the universal sense of ought. What's ought? To be morally right to indicates that somebody has a duty or obligation to do something or that is morally right to do something. To be important indicates that something is important or a good idea. That's ought. Be probable indicates probability or expectation. Everywhere people have a sense of ought, a moral code of sort. That in certain circumstances, certain things should be done. Romans 2.14 For when Gentiles who do not have the law, meaning unbelievers, by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law unto themselves. Who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their consciences are also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. That's the choice. Even among the most remote, remote tribes cut off from civilization, they know in their hearts that there's a God. They know that there's a creation. It's interesting, we, I talked to a missionary once, and the word for the word is logos. And this missionary was in, I think it was in Brazil, somewhere in South America. And they were trying to translate, you know, the, the Bible into their language. And when they came to the word logos, they, they were shocked. They, they knew the logos was the word in the Creator. 
So as the